studies I'm here to tell you that the fire exits if you're an alarm are directly behind you and that will be quicker than going this way which is the other fire exit when you get through those doors please make your way out of the building uh, and uh, onto the uh, road uh, onto the path, pavement next door thank you uh, if you need uh, the uh, uh, restroom then follow either of these doors round to the corner and it's approximately there around there in the corridor uh, we'll be hearing from, uh, from Ollie, as we call him, uh, shortly. But first, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Professor Gazina Manuvalt, who, who's uh, the head of Greek and Latin and the deputy dean of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities, uh, to give her introduction to this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Oliver Duke Williams, Professor of Population Information in the Department of Information Studies here at UCL. The Department of Information Studies is part of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities, which I have the, the pleasure to represent tonight. And this faculty is a fairly broad church. It reaches from the study of the ancient world, with which I usually engage, um, um, to research on various modern languages, cultures, and literatures of, of in, in all sorts of European countries and beyond, as well as to philosophy and all the different varieties of information studies. In view of this, it's also a great delight for me personally to be here tonight and learn about all the interesting bits of research that are done in various parts of this faculty. But now onto to tonight's main topic. Uh, Professor Oliver Duke Williams' inaugural lecture. Many of you will have known Oliver at various stages of his career. Thus, for the benefit of a more comprehensive overview, let me quickly review the main stages of his career to date, highlighting some of the items most important to him. Oliver did his undergrad de degree, a BSc in Geography in Leeds. A destination, as I am told, and chose not so much out of academic strategy, but rather because it satisfied the criteria of being sufficiently far away from home and having a good range of bands that would usually play there. <laughs> For people graduating in the early 1990s like Oliver, the jobs market was moribund. So Oliver opted to, to, for staying a student, doing an MA in Geographic Information Systems. Afterwards, he became a research assistant in Leeds, working on the analysis of migration data and developing software for, for tabulation of these somewhat difficult data. Then, in 1993, he joined the newly formed Center for Computational Geography at Leeds, led by Phil Rees and the late Stan Openshaw, continuing to work on the analysis of internal migration and on statistical disclosure control in these data. During the late 1990s, he started to develop web-based tools to allow users to work with migration and commuting data from the census, which would later become the main distribution route for these data from the 2001 and 2011 censuses. 
this work on delivering complex data would also become part of his PhD on information systems, specifically geared towards migration data. Oliver then joined the Department of Information Studies here at UCL in December 2011. Again, as I'm told, the start was, was quite unusual, because owing to a short notice request, he had to ask on his first day at work whether it would be all right to take the following day off, as he had been asked to be a Father Christmas at a local school. Um, but uh, since then, everything worked, worked well, and apart from the odd day off, he has been working within the Digital Humanities and Knowledge area. He's currently the Program Director for Digital Humanities and works with students in the areas of programming, data visualization, and internet technologies. The UK Data Service is the principal repository for economic population and social research data in the UK. And within this UK Data Service, Oliver directs a census team, with census data being one of the key assets created by this service. The census team is spread across multiple institutions, and it includes specialists in a number of different types of output from the census. So Oliver has extensive experience working on the delivery and analysis of census data, specializing in origin destination data. He's also a senior advisor to the Center for Longitudinal Study Information and User Support, which facil facilitates research access to the Office of National Statistic Longitudinal Study. Since 2018, Oliver has also been a member of the National Statistician's Methodological Assurance Review Panel, which has provided guidance related to the implementation of the 2021 census on proposals related to the future of population statistics and on other developments in related national databases. Thus, as you can see, Oliver is not only a great asset to UCL, but also to the nation as a whole by providing it with essential data analysis. Unsurprisingly, the topic of today's inaugural lecture is taken from Oliver's work on the census data, entitled Counting People, the Past, Present, and Future of Censuses. The census, as I can tell you, was obviously something that was already done in ancient Rome. But Oliver's title derives from the observation that the most recent census taken in the UK was also perhaps the most unusual. The pandemic affecting both the way in which people completed it and the answers that they gave. Also, it may have been the last census of its kind. Alternative data sources offer now the potential for different ways of counting the population, bringing with them their own opportunities and threats. In this lecture, Oliver will reflect on the history of counting people in the UK and how the past can help us to shape the future. This is, of course, a very worthy topic for a UCL professor and thus for an inaugural lecture. Professor Doug Williams, we welcome you to the UCL Professoriate and are very much looking forward to your lecture on counting people, the past, present, and future of censuses. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, dramatic cough. Um, I apologise. Uh, as you know, this was supposed to happen a couple of weeks ago, but COVID intervened, and here we are this evening. So I'd like to start, as is traditional, by thanking my family, friends, colleagues, past and present, um, and everyone I've worked closely with during my career. But in order to expand out the set of people I'm thanking, I'd also like to thank everyone who's ever completed a census in the UK. <laughs> now, those of you in the audience will have differing experiences of the census. Some of you have completed the census in the UK, some of you have completed a census elsewhere, some of you come from countries that don't have censuses, some of you from countries that have censuses more often than we do. Um, but what I want to look at first is the first census that people remember. And for me, the first census that I remember was the 1981 census. I was 11 years old at the time. And my frame of reference for data being collected from a huge number of people 
was elections. And I knew that despite millions of people voting, um, and I didn't think of it in data processing terms, but in huge amounts of data to be processed, you still got the result in the newspaper the following morning. And I can remember being slightly puzzled with the 1981 census that we didn't have the results in the newspaper the following morning. <laughs> and it took me time to learn that, in fact, a census was a rather more difficult undertaking than an election. Similarly, though, you sometimes get results you don't particularly like. <laughs> the underlying question, though, here, of why don't we get the results more quickly, is one that's pertinent to the whole history of the census. When we talk about the history of censuses, it's usual for people to start out by talking about the census of Quirinius in 6 CE. And I don't see why I should do anything different. Um, the, this is by no means the first census, as Christina will know. Uh, this, this goes back far, far earlier. Um, but it is the most famous census. And it's the census um, in which Mary and Joseph travelled to Bethlehem. But, of course, that's probably not true. Um, that's, it's only mentioned in the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Mark contradicts Luke and refers to uh, Jesus being born during the reign of Herod, and Herod had died before the census of Quirinius. So what we learn from this is don't trust everything that you think you're going to learn from a census. Um, now, why do we have a census? For whose benefit are they conducted? Well, they might have a number of purposes, but before we get on to that, I think it's worth asking, what is a census? They've got a number of defining characteristics that set them apart from other sources of information. First of all, their account of individuals. We normally think of population censuses in which we count the people, but we can have censuses of anything. The population census itself is not just a count of people. It's usually a count of households as well. A second characteristic is that a census tries to include everyone within a particular area that it's covering. And here we have a difference between a census and a survey. A survey is collected from a sample of people. A census tries to collect information about everyone. And we can see this difference if we think about a political opinion poll. Political opinion polls typically might ask about a thousand people and then project their results to the nation. Why is this sample of a thousand people better than a Twitter poll that might have 10, 20, 100 times as many respondents? Well, because it's done with a population framework, the polling agencies ask people their, their, their age and their sex and sometimes their previous voting behaviour. And from that, they can reweight their results and give an answer for how many people are going to vote for different uh, parties. The Twitter poll, on the other hand, has no control over or knowledge about who's asking, who's answering their question, what their age and sex is. So the results of it might be entertaining, it might be interesting, but it shouldn't be considered as having any statistical merit. A third characteristic of a census is that they gather a snapshot of the population at a particular time. They happen on a nominal day. In fact, it's not quite as exact as that. In the modern era, they're conducted online and they, you have a completion period of several weeks, but even when they were on paper, that form is delivered to a household sometime in advance of the census, and people often completed it prior to the census day. Censuses are complex undertakings, and it follows from the idea that they try to collect data about everyone, and almost always are mandated to collect data from everyone, that they have to be run by a state and not by a private organisation, because the state has to provide legal threat you will complete the census, won't you? In, in considering why we have a census and what they are, it can be useful to look at ways that we use them. 
So in some countries, such as the US, censuses are used for political apportionment, deciding how many representatives each state will have. In the UK, we use them for planning, with data collected ostensibly to make better decisions, to have better policy. Another characteristic of censuses in the UK is that the data are released after 100 years. And historians may well conceptualise the census in that way, rather than being about contemporary policy. But this isn't a necessary requirement of the census. Not all censuses release their data after a period of time. Censuses don't just enumerate the country. They also influence the way we think about ourselves. They construct the categories used to describe the population. In the introduction to his book, The Sum of the People, Andrew Whitby describes two censuses, which point to more nuanced interpretations of a census about being important in statehood. He talks about the 1948 census of Israel and a series of censuses in Gaza and in the West Bank carried out by the Palestinian Authority. Both of them can be seen as being about more than just collecting numbers. They were about defining and declaring statehood and were carried out as a political act. So, on to this country. Just as we normally start with, with Mary and Joseph, when we're talking about the UK, we start with the Doomsday Book. The Doomsday Book was not a census. It was a collection of information about estates and tenancy of land with a view to how much tax could be generated from the land. But it did include count of many people. Since then, we've had many other counts at a local area of people. But it's not until 1801 that we had a formal census in this country. And the reason why we did that, is, why we started then, is because of dual concerns about what was happening. One, uh, so informed by Thomas Malthus, a concern was about the amount of food that could be produced in the nation and the amount of people consuming that food. And following Malthus, the concern was that the number of people would outstrip the ability of the country to produce food, leading to famine and to unrest. A problem with working out how important this was, was that we didn't know how many people there were. A second concern was about the ability of England to raise an army against France during the Napoleonic Wars. And again, we didn't know how many people there were, so didn't know the potential of the army that could be raised. And these two issues were intertwined because raising an army would necessarily remove labour from agricultural production. So we started in 1801, and the first few censuses were very different to the ones that we have now. They collected aggregate data just the total number of people, not an individual <coughs> list of different people. So there were two sets of questions. One were calculated by overseers of the poor, who reported on the number of houses and the number of families in them, the number of people by sex, and from 1821 onwards, by age as well, and by occupation. Starting out with just three occupation classes and then slowly building to a wider set. We also had some administrative data in those early censuses, which was a historic record of the numbers of baptisms, burials, and marriages that had occurred in each parish. From 1841 onwards, however, we moved to the more usual idea of a census that we listed individual people within households with characteristics about them. The 1841 census the design of it was changed at quite a late stage. Um, it didn't do everything as well as it might have done. Um, but from 1851 onwards, we had an increasingly robust collection of data. And this reflects uh, Victorians and their interests in statistics and in classification. And we see that at a similar period with the emergence of the Royal Statistical Society in the 1830s. Um, it's worth mentioning as well here yeah, 
Um, as, as Cassina said in the introduction, we're in the Faculty of Arts and Humanities. This process of gathering data long predates digital techniques and computers. It was a major information gathering process, but it happened to certainly to start with largely by hand. Now, as I said on the previous slide, there was a slow increase in collection of information over time. This graph shows the number of questions asked in censuses from 1841 or through to 2021. And we can see that not a huge amount changed during the uh, 19th century. And since then, we've had a big increase in the number of questions asked in the census, the number of information points gathered, but it's not solely an upward trend. Actually calculating the number of questions is, is not entirely precise because um, census forms contain some questions which you don't know whether or not to include. Uh, were you born overseas? In which case, answer these questions as well, for example. They also contain some questions which might be thought of as embedding more than one actual question. But the overall picture is that we've had a huge increase in the number of questions asked over time. So, thinking briefly about historic census data, there's a number of routes to using that data. One is a commercial organisation's ancestry and by my past and similar uh, outfits, um, and they provide access to census data along with lots of other types of data. There is an academic version of these data um, from the same source um, that offers differing access levels. There's a redacted version that doesn't have names and addresses, but has occupation detail and age and sex and all that sort of thing. Uh, available for the, the Integrated Census Microdata Project, which is part of the UK Data Archive. And there's also um, a citizen transcription by volunteers um, in a project called FreeSEN. And I've worked a little bit with uh, them and with a sort of larger organisation, Free UK Genealogy. And I've got some examples here. This is from FreeSEN. It could equally be from um, Find My Past. I searched for Margaret Neve. Margaret Neve's quite an inter interesting person. She was the first confirmed female supercentenarian, so someone who reached the age of 110. Um, she also lived through the um, 18th, 19th, and into the 20th centuries, um, which obviously not many people do. She's the earliest born known person to have been able to, to do that. There were a few people who were born later than her who did it, but she's the, the oldest person known to have done that. The other thing that's interesting here that tells us something about analysis of these data is that her age is wrong. In um, This is from the 1861 census. Um, censuses aren't perfect. People make mistakes filling them in. It's not just individuals we can look at. This is looking um, for data in Cornwall um, about use of names. The purple line towards the bottom is a record of people called Florence. And I think they're interesting uh, because there's a massive rise in the number of people called Florence immediately after the point at which Florence Nightingale becomes famous. And I've contrasted that with a few other names. So the red line is Annie, and then the two lines sort of over top of each other, Ellen and Emily. I've selected those because those, like Florence, were names with a big change in the proportion of people called that name over the course of this data. The dotted line is just the total number of uh, women in, in this data, just to compare sort of one set of women's names with, with all women. This is data from people who had survived to 1891. It's not a record of all people ever called Florence and the other names. And in that respect, it's rather like a population pyramid. And population pyramids themselves, uh, themselves are interesting as well. And I picked these because they tell us something about the population, but a lot about the way that information was collected. On the left, we've got population pyramid for the 1841 census. The 1841 census instructed people uh, aged uh, 15 and up to round their age down to the nearest five years. 
or the enumerator who was doing this to round people's ages down to the nearest five years. And we can see that that happened for most people, but there's this little bit in the middle where people gave single years of age, and these were recorded in the census as single years of age. And we can see a little bit of rounding below that as well. Uh, on the right, we've got equivalent population pyramid from the 1851 census, and we can see some grouping on 10-year intervals there, um, probably to do with people not being entirely sure uh, of their age. Uh, finally, in this sort of look at the past, what I think is interesting is to look at the differences between the data transcribed by the FreeSAM project and the data from ISAM, which is transcribed by the commercial organisations. It's quite unusual, I think, for us to have two separate transcriptions of the same big complex source. What I'm looking at here is marital age differences. Um, on the left-hand side, the wife's older than the husband. On the right-hand side, the husband's older than his wife. And we'd see exactly what we'd expect, that for most people, the husband is a few years older than the wife. But what's interesting about this are these long tails either side of really big age differences. Now, that can happen, of course. But some of those are really big. And I think they're to do with errors in transcription. And we've got an example here. So, so this is an image of, um, of an example of a problem with transcription. So we've got a record for William Knight. Abigail is in, in Cornwall. Um, and his wife, Abigail. It's, Abigail's age can be seen nice and clearly at 69. William is transcribed in this data as being 16. <laughs> Maybe. Um, but he's almost certainly 76. And we know he's almost certainly 76 because 10 years earlier, we can find William Knight living with Abigail Knight, and 10 years earlier, he was aged 66. And we can just about see here what looks like a, 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 a mark to make that into a seven. It's got a, a, a pencil mark through it uh, as these data were processed, which makes these things hard to read, both for humans and if we look at sort of AI-based OCR, this isn't necessarily a simple task. From the point of view of OCR, what's interesting to consider is whether it considers each record on its own in isolation, or whether it starts to think about relationships within the household and think, this doesn't make sense. Okay, so moving on to the present. We still have some of the same problems. The census isn't perfect. The outputs we get these days from the census are a number of things. ONS and the other agencies produce a series of reports. What I'm interested in are the research data, and we get different sorts of data. Aggregate data, which is what most people are familiar with in using census data. Uh, the enumeration of how many people are living in a particular area by whatever classification you're interested in. Flow data, uh, which is about the movement of people from one place to another. Cross-sectional microdata, so that's individual level records, uh, anonymized uh, at each census. Longitudinal data, which are individual records linked over time. And digital boundary data, what the outlines of areas are. And these days, the sort of entire outline of the country, obviously that's straightforward. The outlines of small areas for which we report data are based on census data. So they, the census produces its own geography. The 2021 census had a number of peculiarities. And in this, it has some, some echoes of 1921, which is the most recent census from which we've got released data. Um, the 2021 census was obviously held during the pandemic. In Scotland, it was delayed until 2022. The 1921 census was held after the Great Influenza pandemic. And it too was delayed, not by uh, disease, but by um, civil unrest, uh, causing it to, to be delayed for, for a while. Uh, other things that were interesting about 2021, it was collected predominantly online, um, and in terms of using it, 
ONS finally produced a custom output builder where you could say what you wanted and it'll give you the data nice and smoothly, which they've been promising for more than one census and, and been un unable to deliver because it's really quite hard. To emphasize the point about it being collected online, this is a graph from ONS um, showing when people visited the census page. So the big spike in the middle, obviously, is the nominal census day. But we can see that many, many people visited the, the online census portal and probably submitted their data as well a long time prior to the actual census. The 2022 census in Scotland being delayed from 2021 uh, introduces a number of issues for us that are quite unusual uh, in that we're having a census in different parts of the same country at different times. And we can see this particularly in movement data. If you were living in England and then moved to Scotland between 21 and 22, you could be counted in both censuses. Um, if, on the other hand, someone moving the opposite way from Scotland to England, you'd be counted in neither census, probably. So this is unusual. We also see it in journeys to work um, across the border. The number of people moving from England to Scotland and Scotland to England is broadly in balance. However, the number of people living in Scotland and working in England against the number of people living in England and working in Scotland are less balanced. So that's where it becomes a bit more problematic. Another issue to do with the pandemic um, was a dilemma about how people should respond to workplace questions. This was one of the big questions affected by the pandemic. Many people were working at home. Many other people weren't. They were carrying on working in shops, working in warehouses, driving buses, um, all sorts of jobs that you can only do in person. But if you were working at home, how should you respond to the workplace questions? Do you respond as the new normal, as we used to call it then, that you were working at home? Or do you reflect back to what you were doing before you started working at home? The guidance was to say, report what you're doing now, not what you were doing at the start of the pandemic. However, on the other hand, if you were furloughed, you were told to respond with what you were doing before you became furloughed. So these data are really quite, quite confusing. The logic for that was that sort of the most obvious analogue for being furloughed was being on parental leave. If you were on parental leave at the time of the census, you'd respond with what you used to do in your job before you went on parental leave, and as you might expect to go back to it. Uh, some examples, are, and this is possibly the most, most significant thing in the 2021 census. Here we've got methods of journey to work, uh, 1991, 2001, 2011, we see driving a car is the most common, but it doesn't change much over that time. There's a slow increase in working at home. When we look at the 2021 data, we've gone from 11% of people working at home to 31%. Now, futurists have spent a long time telling us that we're going to start working at home or at local little sort of electronic offices, that sort of thing. Um, but it's always been something that's going to be happening in the future. The pandemic made this happen almost overnight. And the census hasn't really caught up with being able to, to, to process this idea. The census and the questions about work, uh, I'd argue, are written in a sort of mythology of 1950s Britain, where typically the husband will go to work, the wife will be at home. Um, maybe not, maybe the 1950s was slightly more advanced than that. Um, but the important thing is people had one job, they went to it every day using the same method of transport, they came home again. And that's just not realistic for, for uh, modern society. People have more than one job, they do different things on different days, and the census hasn't really caught up with that idea yet. Um, we can map this data. Uh, so this is uh, the most common mode of travel to work. 
Uh, on the left-hand side, the sort of raw results, and we see this for London. Black, or the dark grey, is people working at home. And we see the map dominated by people working at home. It's not saying everyone worked at home. It's not even saying more than half of the people worked at home. It's saying in each tiny area, the most common observation was that people were working at home. On the left-hand side, I've removed work at home, and then I've looked at the second most common way of travelling to work. And the reason for doing that is to find areas where you think you might be able to convert people from travelling in one mode to travelling in another, and specifically from travelling in cars to using public transport or active modes of transport. Um, and we don't really see that if we just look at the most common mode of travel to work, especially ignoring 2021, all we see is people using cars. What's interesting is to find people, find places where people could use the bus, could use public transport, could use active transport. Other work I've done on, on contemporary issues are related to the longitudinal data. So these are less commonly used than other forms. In, in the UK, we've got three studies, one in England and Wales, one in Scotland and one in Northern Ireland, and they link people over time. You may be familiar with the 7up documentary series, which similarly tracks people over time. That's a, a cohort model study. Census data take people of all ages and follow them over time. And I'm using the, the ONS longitudinal study that's based on four birth dates. So four birth dates within the year are selected to include people. Those dates aren't published, and a key part of the design is that people who are in this study don't know that they're in the study. It includes census data, vital events data, such as births and deaths, uh, and some administrative data. And in this, what we see is individual anonymized records for sample members and for other people in the household at the same time. This is really disclosive, so access to the data is very strongly controlled. And I, to introduce it, I've got the question, who changes religion? Religion is not an immutable characteristic, it can change over time, and the LS allows us to look at those changes. And where I've started is with Jedi. Um, this was a kind of social phenomenon that started in 2001, was seen in the censuses in New Zealand, Australia and Canada, as well as the UK, with people declaring their religion to be Jedi. And in each case, um, it fell 10 years later, or whenever the next census was. In the UK, it was the largest non-traditional religion in 2001, and despite a big fall, remained the largest non-traditional religion. But are these the same people, or are they just another set, probably, of students putting down what they want to put? And the answer to the sort of slide we had a moment ago is that of all the people that started out as Jedi, who were in the cycle in 2001, and um, two days later, only until about 15% of them actually stayed to change religion, or change the religion they identify as in the census, we should say. And there might be two reasons for this, at least. One is that 10 years previously, they were living at home, their parents filled out the census form for them, and they're now establishing a new identity. Another is just that in adulthood, they've reflected on their beliefs and uh, modified their religion. We can also use the LS to look at migration over time. Um, and this is some research I've done with, with colleagues. And I've just picked out what I've done here. So in 1971, I was one year, one year old, living in the East Midlands. 1981, living in a different part of the East Midlands. 1991, I was a student, most of the time living in Yorkshire and Humberside, some of the time at my parents' address. 
2001, I was living elsewhere in Yorkshire and other side, all full time. 2011, living in London. 2021, living in London. And finally, living in the same place as I had been 10 years previously. How common is this? Well, we're not, I wasn't interested in saying, are people the same as me? I don't want to track my identity in this. But a more general question is, how do people move? What sort of patterns do we see en masse? And what we did was pick sort of two samples of people, uh, one set who'd simply been present at every census from 1971 to 2011. Sometimes people disappear for a census, either because they're out of the country somewhere, or, simply, or that they didn't fill in their census, or that it hasn't been linked in the linkage process. And, and then a more tightly controlled one, people who'd been present at every point and who'd moved in each intercensal period. So this doesn't include me, because I've got an intercensal period when I didn't move. We started off by looking at people who, uh, from, from their start in 1971, were in the same region in 2011. And we see uh, the stark difference between London and everywhere else. Everywhere else, most of these people who have moved regularly are in the same region that they started in, um, in 1971. London is the exception. Of all the people who started in London in 1971 um, and have moved in every subsequent decade, 24% of them were still in London in, in 2011, and 17% had stayed in London for their whole time. So London's this, this engine of migration that people move into London and out of London, but on the whole don't carry on moving within London, unlike the, the other uh, areas. Um, we considered the numbers of possible trajectories that, we, that people could have. There are 10 regions and five points at which we see people, and that gives 100,000 possible combinations of region that people can be living in uh, over these sort of uh, five points. We've, um, we picked people who were aged under 20 in 1971, um, and the reason for doing that was they were probably living at home with their parents in 1971, and we were interested into whether we could look at connections between their, their sort of parental environment when they were young and the way they moved. What I picked up here is people who moved between each census, um, ignoring all the people who stayed in the same region. Um, and what we see is this is dominated by London, people starting out in London, moving from place to place within London, and then moving out of London. And of course, this, this is observed quite a lot for right or Rightly or wrongly, however you politically frame it, people escaping from London to, to better housing, more green areas, whatever it might be. Um, and the only thing that we see that isn't to do with London are people moving within Yorkshire and Armside and then going to the East Midlands. So slightly similar to me, but I was going in a different direction. We, get, we see very few of these. So this is 13 people, which is the, biggest, the smallest number we can report is 10. So this is only just reportable. Um, it's in a 1% sample of the population. But the real thing to, to, to say here is that we can't really do anything with this. We can't divide it by any other characteristic because the numbers are too small. So these are some of the things we can do with censuses. Some of the things we can, beyond just saying how many people are in different places, some of the more interesting things we can do with censuses. But censuses have problems. And the first is they're out of date. And I've got two quotes here. Nobody wants to wait 10 years to find out what the population is, least of all governments and politicians. Councils need to know where people are, are actually living, what ages they are, and what services they might need. And at a time of rapid change and development, the traditional 10 years is too long to wait for the hard figures, which only a census gives. So two people worrying about the census being out of date. The first of these is from Georgina Sturge in her book about data, and is about contemporary handling of the census. But pretty much exactly the same 
concern being raised was by the Minister of Health in 1963. So almost 60 years earlier, we had exactly the same concern about censuses. An example of places changing over time. This is the area around my local tube station. On the left, we've got an image from uh, 2011 from Google Maps. We're looking up the roads towards the tube station. And the main thing we can see in this picture is a car park. 13 or so years later, on the right, we've got a sort of Google Maps rendering of what the area is like now. And you can see it's full of big residential blocks that have been built where that car park was. So the area has changed hugely, including the number of people trying to get on the tube at Lacrosse Road. <coughs> During the pandemic, when the census was taken in 2021, some of these residential blocks were complete, but not all of them. Some of them had people living in them, but not all of them. But this, this process has definitely started. But we still won't see the full effect of this in the 2021 census. So showing that not only is 2011 out of date, but even the 2021 census is already out of date. We can take one more thing from this, I think, and that's the extent to which we trust Google Maps. On the left, we've got a car park. On the right, the tallest of the residential blocks is marked, still marked in Google Maps as being a car park. <laughs> Sometimes, despite the census being out of date, it's the best we can do. Um, ONS's last output from the 2011 census was in 2020, so nine years after it was taken. They produced a very complicated table that had nine million rows in it. And what those nine million rows showed was the combination, the number of households with different combinations of people of different ages living in them. And the reason they did this was to help uh, uh, COVID exposure modeling. Um, and what I've highlighted on the map is the proportion of households that had both people aged under 19 in them, so they were probably going to school, um, and at the same time, people aged 65 plus um, who were in the age groups more at risk from COVID. So these households are interesting. They've got people at risk and they've got people going out and potentially bringing COVID back with them. Th these data are from 2011. Have households changed a great deal until 2020 when we're interested in using this data? We don't know. We presume they haven't changed hugely but this is the best data we've got, and that's the data we have to use. Another problem with censuses is, is that they're really difficult to use. They're complex. And to illustrate that, uh, this diagram, which I don't expect you to be able to read, but it's produced by the Office for National Statistics and shows every sort of geography that's understood in censuses. The different colours are different sort of themes, like health, uh, postal, electoral, and so on. The only thing to take home from this is that the geography of the UK is tremendously complicated. And the one common factor of all of these different geographies is that at some stage, someone's going to want some denominator information for those geographies in order to calculate something else. And the census needs to either try and produce that or at least model it the best it can. Censuses cost money. This is another problem with them. The 2021 census um, in England and Wales, uh, ONS's budget was £900 million. Some of that was for developing processes within ONS that were applied to other sorts of data as well. But it gives us a headline count of about £15 per person to carry out the census. But as we've seen from the previous slides, the censuses go on being useful. So we can arguably divide that by 10, because they're 10 years apart, and we get £1.50 per person per year is the cost of the census. The US 2020 census cost $13.7 billion. They've got a larger population. The headline amount there is about twice as much as the headline amount in the UK. The Australian census uh, cost $565 million. They're all expensive. Um, 
the Australian census is carried out every five years. So if you're aiming for compar comparability with the ONS and US calculations, um, the Australian census comes out as being a little bit cheaper. If instead you divide by five years, um, it becomes a little bit more expensive, but it's certainly within the same ballpark. On the right-hand side, we've got public sector, public sector spending plans in 2019, the year before, or a couple of years before the census, the year before the pandemic. And we can see that 900 million pounds is a small proportion of the overall national budget, but it's not insignificant. On the other hand, um, worked on by ONS to look at the value of the census on which they use in their own material has argued that for every pound invested in the census, the nation got back five pounds worth of value in terms of better policy, better informed planning, and so on. Another problem with the census is that people don't trust it. This is a report on the operation of an American census, and I've emphasised the bit that I think is important. Those who found the figures tally with their expectations were given to cry out that a census was of little use, they knew all about it beforehand. While those who found that the figures didn't support their theories attacked the census methods, and sometimes did not hesitate to accuse the census takers of writing with anonymous and misrepresenting the facts. Now this could be a contemporary criticism of censuses. It's actually from comments on a paper read by Herman Hollerith to the Royal Statistical Society in 1894. And Hollerith was talking about the tabulation machine he designed to take the 1890 census in the US. The reason for doing this was that the 1880 census in the US had taken eight years to finish processing all of the data. And they knew that there were going to be more people in 1890. So this was becoming an unsupportable problem. And they wanted a faster way of processing the data. So Hollerith developed a system using punched cards. There'd be a set of people to punch statistics onto cards. And then they'd go into a tabulation machine to calculate all the outputs. And this, this worked really, really well. Uh, Hollerith, Hollerith's company, uh, through a series of mergers, later became at least part of IBM. Another view of trust in the census. These are, this graph is showing the level of opting in in two countries to data release after a period of time. So in the UK, we have our data released after 100 years, and that always happens. That's not true in other countries. Australia and Canada, you have to opt in to your data being released uh, after 99 years. And the blue line's for Canada, and we see what I felt was a relatively low level of opting in, starting in sort of 2006 at about 55%, but growing quite steadily over the time to be over 80% in 2016, when the law in Canada was changed and release after time became default. The red line is for Australia, and something interesting happens there. Uh, acceptance, opting in, is growing slowly, and then falls dramatically in 2016. And this is because ABS, prior to the 2016 census, had discussed how they wanted to retain linkage identifiers in order to deal with the problem of the census being out of date, in order to link new data to the census. This went down really badly. Um, there were many stories in the Australian media about pri privacy, about criticising the methods of ABS, and that's reflected in, in this sharp fall in people opting in to their data being released uh, 99 years later. Trust is bound up, and, and sort of in the Australian example, is bound up in the questions we ask, uh, the way we ask them, and the way we tell the public about what we're going to do. So we can ask about what questions we should ask, what questions are appropriate, and so on. And this varies from country to country. In the UK, we don't ask about income. It's tested prior to each census, and each time it's been tested, the response 
level for those forms of included a question about income is lower than the response for the forms that don't have an income question. Yeah. To an extent that ONS are worried that overall response would be affected. In other countries, a question about income is considered entirely normal. The most common trope about questions of the census, in the census, and whether they're appropriate, is about whether women will report their age. So we have a, uh, a cut in here from Punch in 1871, with, with on the left, um, sort of head of the household filling in the census, uh, saying, what do you intend to be this time, Maria? Last time you were 31, 30 the time before, uh, and she replies, tell the truth, dear, 32. So this, this trope of women not reporting their, their age accurately is a common one. Uh, Punch's cartoon in, in 1871 was so funny that they made pretty much the same joke in 1881 and in 1891. And as Private Eye would point out about Punch, it's never actually funny anyway. Um, other tropes in cartoons about the census uh, looks at so sort of supposed incompetence of census agencies. Um, so on the left, uh, country can't have a census, they had plenty of warning. On the right, a cartoon from New Zealand, uh, saying, uh, amazingly, people who don't have internet access didn't answer the question about whether they'd got internet, uh, didn't respond to the online census. We can also think about the answers we get from questions. So we decide what questions we're going to ask, and then we look at the answers we get. And there's questions here that are interesting about accuracy. Do we require people to be accurate in their answers? And the immediate response would be, say, well, of course they do. Of course we do. Um, but I'm not sure that's, that's universally true. This is an uh, excerpt from a much larger table about country of birth from the 2021 census, um, in which we see 34 people in England and Wales born in Antarctica. This is interesting because the exact number of people born in Antarctica is known, and that is 11 people. Um, and they were all born to Argentinian or Chilean parents. So, and, and the oldest of them at the time of the 2021 census was 43. Um, so the fact that of those 11, 34 of them are living in England and Wales seems unlikely. This is bogus data. It's slightly better than uh, 2011, where we had 51 Antarcticans. Um, but I'm not particularly bothered about this. I, I've got a sort of supposition that I haven't tested, that people will give this sort of slightly rebellious answer to some questions in the census. Um, but it will actually make them fill in their census form. And what would be interesting to look at is the level of quality of answers in, in the rest of their form. And this, of course, connects us back to, to our friends the Jedi. Uh, again, most people putting in that in as a sort of joke answer, but it made them fill their census in. And it just finally, in terms of thinking about the answers we get, we can think about the ways answers are processed, where the answers are recording, recorded. Um, according to, to sort of colleagues in ONS, to go along with our Jedi, we also had a number of SIF. And this was from OCR capture of data. When they looked at this, they realized it was actually just a mistranscription of SIF. <laughs> so, so no SIF, I'm afraid. But it tells you something, OCR will make mistakes. Um, and, you know, making a mistake in one character can make it look like a different answer. So, the census has problems. It's not perfect. And this brings us to the future of the census. The 2021 census has been reported uh, in the media about possibly being the last census. Perhaps it should be, perhaps it shouldn't be. This news, however, isn't new. We have almost exactly the same headline here from 2011, asking whether that would be the last census. We have a discussion from 2001 about whether that would be the last census because of problems of quality. 
And this is reflected in academic literature as well, of whether we're at the end of the era of censuses. And so we can think about how to move forward. And my first question I, I thought about, um, as every talk these days has to cover, can AI help us? It can help us in some ways, I think. I mentioned earlier that a problem with the census is that it's really complex. AI and natural language engines might help people to query the census, to ask questions of it in a way that they find easier than a sort of complex uh, sort of interface system where you have to pick different things from different places, produce an answer, uh, and hope that you can understand it. Another thing I thought about was whether AI can help us understand the results. And in order to do that, I thought, let's try and visualize some data. I asked uh, Copilot, which is one of the sort of AI engines, uh, this. I asked it to draw 100 people representative of the current population of the United Kingdom in terms of characteristics such as age, sex, ethnic group, occupation, and household tenure. And I chose those items kind of deliberately um, because they're becoming increasingly hard to represent. Age and sex and ethnic group, at least using sort of norm normative representation of those, we can draw a person that, that matches various groups. Occupation becomes harder. Some people have clothes that they work at, wear at work that indicates their occupation, but most people don't. Household tenure, whether you've got a mortgage, whether you rent, etc., is really quite hard to, to represent visually. So as these engines do, Copilot gave me four images as an answer. None of them have 100 people in them. So that's its, it's first problem, using what I thought was a simple request. It got it horribly wrong. Um, I've picked two of these to look at a little bit more closely. Um, this is the one with the fewest number of people. There are about 130 people here, I think. It shows the UK population as being largely white and elderly. Um, I don't think this is a particularly good representation. This is the next smallest number of people. It seems to do better in terms of representation of age and ethnicity. It's interesting in that of the four pictures, this is the only one that has any sort of really obvious visual display of someone with, uh, with a disability. There's someone here in a wheelchair. So possibly it's doing quite well. I haven't even asked it to try and include um, ability or disability within its answer. And it's done that for me. But before we think it's being too clever, look up at the top left-hand corner, and we appear to have a ghost. Um, so I don't trust this as well. But the, the take-home thing is certainly at the moment, if we thinking that an AI can represent data for us, simplify data, it's not doing a very good job of it. So we turn to administrative data, and that's what ONS are interested in. And ONS have consulted over the past year on a plan to collect, instead of a census, use administrative data to report on the population of the country. And they've done an enormous amount of research into this. And this is research I've, I've worked on with colleagues in, in, in MARP, the Methodological Assurance Panel. Administrative data have some advantages. They're more timely. They're collected continuously, and results are reported continuously or annually or, or whatever it might be. But we don't have this 10-year delay between cycles. There may be new sources of data, and income is a good example of that. We can potentially link with tax data to get that missing income data that researchers want, but which is deemed to be unacceptable to collect. Some of the costs are already met. So administrative data are data carried out, produced by one agency as part of their everyday activities that can be repurposed for statistical reasons. So the NHS produces enormous amounts of data. That data can be mined to extract population data and so on. And, and the 
the main costs are already met, but reprocessing, reprocessing the data is still expensive. But those additional costs of reprocessing the data, rather than being really tightly clustered every 10 years, are spread out over time. There are some disadvantages. The biggest problem we have is a lack of common identifiers. We don't have a single identifying code that everyone has. We have NHS numbers, we have national insurance numbers, we have various sorts of um, uh, personal identifiers in different systems, but they're not linked. Admin data, just like census data, suffers from both undercount and overcount at the same time. Undercount is where you should have a record for someone, but that record doesn't exist. Overcount is where you are, uh, possibly you've got the person in the wrong place, but often you've got more than one record for the same person, and you have to try and work out what the truth of all of that is, and that leads you to, 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 to contemplate what does truth mean anyway in, in this sort of data. There are concerns about the level of detail. So for example, with ethnic group, data, we can do reasonably good estimates of the high level groups, but smaller subdivisions of ethnic groups, um, that, that level of detail is, is still uh, needs work. The questions about the whole operation of it, it requires uh, government agencies, government ministries giving data to ONS, and in order to have a robust system, there needs to be a guarantee that that will persist over time. We worry about whether definitions are consistent between different sources. Um, we can uh, worry about whether sources are there for everything we want. And another factor is ignores the social role of the census. <coughs> How do we do a very, very simplified view is we gather data from multiple sources, from education sources, from health sources, from tax sources. Try and find people in this. We don't need to know any of their characteristics at this point. We're just trying to get their name, their identity, and where they live to build up an index of people. The fact that you've got data from multiple sources means they have to be linked. That's quite difficult. We then have to remove incomplete records and worry about duplicate records. If we consider NHS numbers, you can have one person with more than one NHS number. You can also have NHS numbers that are shared between more than one person. These are problems in the data, but they need to be addressed. Um, finally, we can sort of de determine a very basic list of people by age and sex and local authority. And only after we've done that do we start to worry about attaching attribute data to those records. This is a table that was included in ONS's consultation, and it's showing um, the various questions asked in the census um, by how much research progress has been made and how good coverage is in other data sources. The lower left part are the, the problem areas where little research has been done and there's little coverage in data. Um, these include some interesting questions about identity. I'd argue that the most serious issue here is the question about occupation. We won't have any knowledge of social mobility if we don't know about people's occupation. We also won't know about uh, sort of occupational uh, inequalities in representation. Now we can get some of that data from the Transformed Longitude uh, Lake Force Survey, but possibly not everything we want. And one of the key points is the LFS is a sample. We're not getting this information for everyone, we're just getting it from a, for a small set of people. And like an opinion poll, have to try and scale that up to the nation. The, the, the connection to work where we do have information for everyone is in tax information and benefits information. But the problem is tax agencies are only really interested in who we work for and how much we're paid. They're not interested in the jobs we do because it's not part of the thing they need to know for their everyday operation. So we've got a number of approaches we can follow. We could carry on with a traditional census, but we know there are problems. It's out of date before it's released. And as I said, possibly the questions that are asked are no longer fit for purpose. 
We could switch to an administrative system, as might happen. But we can also consider hybrid and complementary approaches. Having both administrative census data and a decennial census. As I said, the census more than pays for itself. Um, so I don't think cost here is an issue. If we did that, we wouldn't necessarily have the same census as we do now. We could look at sample censuses, short form censuses with far fewer questions on them. We can consider some other modes as well. So there's a lot of interest in use of big data and use of mobile phone data. Mobile phone data are really interesting. Um, one of the sources of data we don't have a good alternative for is travel to work. But if you can follow someone's mobile phone, you've got a really good idea of where they live, where they work, and the speed at which they're progressing through their route. And possibly they disappear at one stage, at one tube station, reappear at a new tube station. We can make good guesses about how people get to work. The problem with phone data, as I see it, is linking it to other data. We want to know the characteristics of people who are traveling to work. Their private data. I can't see any feasible way in which they're going to be linked to individuals. But even if we could link phone data to individuals, there's another problem, that they're really noisy, really messy. There are three phones in this lecture theater that I pay for. Um, two, two of them, I rather suspect the people who are using them are hoping I've forgotten that I'm still paying. <laughs> um, but who do you know whose phone is which? And I don't think this is an isolated problem. It's not just me. Um, lots of people uh, are also paying for household phones. How we connect them, even if we had the identity data from the phone companies that I don't think we're going to get, we can't do that, that effectively. So what we'd end up with is one set of data that's all about travel to work, and another set of data that's all about the characteristics of people, but we wouldn't be able to marry the two together. The big elephant in the room here is about a population register. I said the problem with administrative data is that we've got different identifiers. If we had an identity card, if we had a single national personal identifier, the whole thing would be far easier. Of course, ID cards, population registers are subject to huge political debate um, and are usually considered to be politically unacceptable in the UK. Like the income question, other countries accept them as being entirely normal. One of the problems, I think, with the political argument about uh, population registers is that they're sold to the public, or politicians attempt to sell them to the public on, on sort of big sexy issues like identity theft and national security, and somehow it's going to prevent terrorism because terrorists are going to say who they are by their identity number. Um, they're not sold to the, to the nation on saying, it will make public administration a bit easier. Because that's quite a boring thing to try and sell to the public. But I think if we're considering how we move forward, we should revisit this question of do we want a population register? Even if we come to the answer, no, it's still un unacceptable, we should be considering that question. There are challenges further ahead in the future. As I've said throughout, and linking back to the beginning, in the UK, data are retained and released after 100 years. Um, the major source of information for, for historians, for historical demographers, for family historians, and so on. And there's a question about what we keep. If we're thinking about census schedules, usually it's fairly obvious what we keep. keep. We keep the names and, and all the information in the census schedule. We might also keep a photo of it. When we're looking at administrative data, what do we keep? All these are going to be our streams of data. We're not going to get any hand-completed forms here. Um, all we're going to get is the processed data. And this is, is this going to engage people in the future? Is seeing great-grandpa's tax data from 100 years ago going to be as interesting as seeing the handwritten form that the family 
filled in? Probably not. But even if we think about retaining census forms, it becomes difficult to, to there are challenges to what we record. So this is an example of uh, the 1911 census, with, um, uh, which was boycotted by, by suffragettes um, in many cases. Um, so we have a form, this is by the National Archive, um, a form where it's been filled in for the whole family. Um, the sort of wife in the family has crossed her name out um, because she wanted to boycott the census. And, and the, the, the husband, the head of household, has written this really snippy bit at the bottom <laughs> um, complaining about his wife being a suffragette um, and she should know her place and, and so on. But it's these sort of emendations on forms that are often the interesting bits. Um, rather than just seeing it as a stream of, of carefully sort of structured data. It does make it difficult to know in a database what of this to retain. Should your, your database have all these extra fields for interesting things that have been written on the form? One approach to this, to this problem, that was interesting was the Census of Ireland in 2022. And this was completed on a paper form, and at the very end, there was a blank space in which people could write a message to the future. And sort of, I've, I've spoken about this to various people in different census agencies, and they kind of pretty much all said, I wish we'd thought of that. Um, about 19% of uh, households put something in that box. So it was by no means universal. One of the interesting things that happened, though, at the time, was that people photographed this and put on social media what they'd put in this space. And we got lots of different uh, examples, sort of on Twitter and on other platforms, of this. And I've selected just one to, to illustrate this. Uh, the person has filled in a, drawn a picture of, of Will Smith and Chris Rock at the Oscars in 2022. And this, uh, the reason I think this is interesting, I'm um, in a way kind of harking back to my point about the celebrity of Florence Nightingale at the time. We still know who Florence Nightingale is. In a hundred years' time, will people know who Will Smith and Chris Rock are? Or will they just think that great-grandpa has weirdly drawn two men fighting <laughs> on, on, on the census form with no explanation? Um, so it's interesting what we often want to, our message to the future is, is very contemporary, uh, out of context. Um, it's interesting to see how much of this will survive. If we did want to give messages to the future, what would we include? So coming towards the end, sorry, um, we come to the question, should we retain a census? I think there are various arguments. Poor arguments are that it's what we've always done. The census has had a 200 year run, not many institutional happenings achieve that. Um, maybe as time has come. Another weak argument is cost, as I said, the census pays for itself. Better arguments is that some information is hard to gather or impossible to gather by other sources, and also it provides the trusted framework for sampling for creating all the other surveys that we want to run. All of them rely on reweighting their data like an opinion poll. In order to do that, you need a set of age and sex data that you really, really trust to do that re-rating. I think there are also arguments for a hybrid approach. Censuses and admin data are different, and they tell us different things. If we try and see one as a replacement for the other, rather than as complementary for the other, we're kind of missing the point that they're collecting different things in, in different ways. But sort of finally, my worry about this is built in thinking about HS2. HS2 was sort of sold on probably not the best arguments. It was sold on being high speed rather than just producing the extra train capacity that we desperately need. The government got spooked, cut funding, and we've ended up with a system that doesn't start where we want it to start and doesn't go to where we want it to go. And there's a danger with a switch to an administrative system that the same thing could happen. Governments could cut funding, it will end up doing sort of 
half or two thirds of the job, but not all of the job. And that's what we want to focus on, I think, as we look to the future. What do we want to know about ourselves? What data methods are we going to use to collect that information that we want to know about ourselves? Uh, I, I did have a final bit, but I've, I've gone off script. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, so, so what we want to hope is that our population migrant statistics don't end up as HS2. We need to remember that admin data will constantly change. We're all used to at work all the time. There's a new system for doing that. <laughs> the same thing happens everywhere. Admin data processing isn't something to be solved overnight. It's something that's going to have to be solved repeatedly in the future. We're at an interesting branching point, in a way a bit like we were in 1841. And the future is currently unknown. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks for coming, everyone. And I'm very much hoping there are drinks and canapes outside. Thank you. Right. There are drinks and canapes. You're all welcome to join us in the foyer here. Uh, thank you again, uh, Ollie, for uh, such a great presentation. Fascinating stuff. And if you've got questions, I'm sure you'll be happy to take them. Uh, yeah. Over drinks uh, in the foyer.